To introduce Tom Goldtooth, I would like to invite Chief Len Malerba, who is from the, Mohe from the Mohegan tribe. Um, the Mohegan tribe are known as the Wolf People, children of Mundo and participants in the Tree of Life. Their ancestors as the roots, the living tribe forming the trunk, and their descendants being the buds of the tree's future. Chief Malerba is the first female chief of the Mohegan tribe in 300 years. And it is a lifetime appointment. Her mother, Loretta Roberge, is the tribal noner, the tribe's elder female of respect. In her tribal leadership role, Chief Malerba represents the tribe at tribal and non-tribal functions in conjunction with the elected leadership of the tribe. She conducts tribal ceremonies and works to safeguard the cultural and historical integrity of the Mohegan tribe. She has been involved in issues of peacemaking, repatriation of artifacts, and efforts to strengthen the knowledge of Mohegan youth regarding their history and identity. Uh, she has been the executive director of the tribe's health and human services. She holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of Connecticut, a doctorate of nursing practice from Yale University, and an honorary doctorate from St. Joseph College in Hartford. She lives in Uncasville with her husband, Paul. Welcome, Chief Malerga, to introduce tonight's Gandhi's Peace Award Laureate. Well, thank you so very, very much for inviting me to be part of this very, very, very special event, and my congratulations in, in advance to the honorees, both of you. Um, it's just you know, amazing to hear the stories and to read about everyone here. So I would say, what greetings from our Mohegan people. I'm so, you know, so in awe of the stories that I've heard already tonight, and I know that the story that will be shared by Tom Goldtooth. But you know, I want to say that you know, indigenous nations have, are often in the forefront of these environmental battles um, here that challenge our sovereign governments, but also challenge our native life ways. And, and it has been centuries of trying to reclaim our, our native life ways and to hold on to our native life ways. There have been heartbreaking examples of this recently. Um, the selling of the San Carlos Apache sacred land to international copper mining interests. The proposed Keystone XL pipeline, tar sands proliferation, water spills into the Colorado River with toxic mining chemicals, um, reservations that are Superfund toxic sites, byproducts of large corporate industries, to name just a few. Indigenous nations have suffered and continue to suffer the effects of relocation, denial of indigenous life ways and food ways, and the connection to the sacred earth that our ancestors are buried on. In fact, our Mohegan peoples uh, burial grounds, one was made into a state park taken by eminent domain. We had to buy it back from the state of Connecticut. And the other uh, building was built on top of, and we had to finally take that building down once we regained control of the land and reinter our bones. You know, so as Tom notes, since these actions are considered environmental racism, hurting the first peoples of our land, and it is the first peoples of our land that will help restore this land and bring justice and social justice to this land. And so while all of these issues can feel very overwhelming, it is the grassroots efforts that turn into international efforts, just like the one that Tom Goldtooth has spearheaded, that provide leadership and opposition to the devastating policies allowing these things to happen. A year ago, there was a major rally in Washington, D.C. that was nicknamed Cowboys and Indians against the Keystone XL Pipeline. Teepees dotted the National Mall. 
Um, but indigenous efforts to stop environmental plunder go back much, much earlier. For example, in opposition to gold mining and the genocide of the bison, when gold was discovered in California, 500,000 lives were lost in two decades, and they were all indigenous lives. Indeed, here in Connecticut, there are numerous petitions to the colony of Connecticut and subsequently to the state of Connecticut to stop the des desecration and the misuse of our lands. It is clearly fitting that the Gandhi Peace Award be given to Tom Goldtooth. Tom is of Diné and Dakota ancestry. He grew up on a Navajo reservation near the Colorado River, sadly the site of the latest environmental spill. He is the executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Network, which is based in Bemidji, Minnesota. Formed by a coalition of grassroots indigenous people and individuals to address environmental and economic justice issues, this indigenous environmental network has grown to over 150 groups. That's really powerful. And it is the power of one person who is committed to that initiative to get those many people to align and join with that cause. The hashtags on their site, hashtag keep it in the ground, hashtag save oat flats, hashtag our power summer, provide insight into just a few of their numerous activities. And it was hard for me to not just click around on that website and can you continue to read all day today. Tom Goldtooth is a major figure internationally with his voice heard at major climate conferences. He's no stranger to civil disobedience himself. His message has not always been well received by those in power. In 2010, he was kicked out of the UN, uh, the UN climate meeting in Cancun. Perhaps you've been kicked out of better places. <laughs> And the reason he was kicked out was because he had the nerve to criticize the popular notion of reducing greenhouse gases by carbon trading. He commented on this issue on Democracy Now! stating, you know, there's institutions, there's financiers, the governments of the North, they're all invested in this carbon market scheme. And here in Cancun, the United Nations climate meeting is selling the sky, Father Sky, to the highest bidder, using indigenous people's forests to soak up their pollution instead of reducing emissions at its source. In 2011, he and a number of other Native American leaders were arrested in front of the White House, the Great White Father's House, during an IEN protest of the proposed Keystone XL pipeline. At that time, he said, the Canadian tar sands, the proposed Keystone XL, and all other current and proposed pipelines and heavy hauls are weapons of mass destruction, leading to the path to triggering the final overheating of Mother Earth, our Mother Earth. President Obama made promises to Native nations. Here is an opportunity for him to honor those promises and be a man of conscience by standing up to corporate power by addressing the compounding changes of climate change and overconsumption of the resources of Mother Earth and by saying no to the Keystone XL pipeline. He has co-produced the award-winning documentary film Drumbeat for Mother Earth, which has received critical acclaim for its exposure of the effects of bioaccumulative chemicals on indigenous communities. And we all know that indigenous people metabolize things a bit differently than the people who have come to our shores. In 2010, he was honored by the Sierra Club and by the NAACP as a green hero of color. Last month, Tom was in Paris coordinating with indigenous leaders from many countries to develop the strategic efforts necessary to combat the international climate decisions that are expected to be negotiated in December of this year in that city. He intends to remind the great powers that indigenous have rights to land through treaties and UN declarations, and those rights must be respected. And let us remember, most all of those treaties have been broken. And some of those treaties really were never intended for the benefit of our indigenous people. They were intended to neutralize us, they were intended to assimilate us, and they were intended to get rid of the Indian problem. But it is a testament to all of the people who have come before us 
that we are still here. And it is a testament to the people just like Tom that we continue to share our knowledge with people that can make this planet a better planet and a safer planet. In honoring his spiritual beliefs, Tom rejects the notions that humans have dominion over the earth. The idea that animals and land are mere things for humans to do as they will with. He values the concept of Mother Earth, that Earth and non-living humans have intrinsic value, and that each play a role in the harmony and balance in our world. The phrase, all my relations, when a native speaks the, that phrase, includes animals, planets, sky, water, and earth alongside human beings, each with an imbued spirit, each with, with rights to, the, to share this land with us. Our spirits are joined. Tom insists that we challenge an economic system that it exploits and abuses nature. His efforts protect all our relations. He reminds us that it takes only one person to raise a voice and make a difference. It is truly my honor to be here tonight to recognize Tom Goldtooth as, as this organization, Promoting Enduring Peace, presents him with the Gandhi Peace Award. So I say to you, my brother, Mutawe wa itu wokanch waskichiki, many blessings upon you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm never uh, one uh, lost with words, but I'm lost with words right now. I was looking at this water. I'm going to free this water. It's, it's been uh, captured. <laughs> it was just waiting to break loose. <laughs> Yat eh, say yat eh, say that yat eh, hello, say ha, while the woman say huh, huh, as men say ha, or how, that's uh, both our languages, both on the Dakota site, ha, and then yat uh, eh, in our Dene, our Navajo way, my mom. And so, the Bethlehem Shini Na Shle, the Kota Oyate Basha Shichi. I want to dedicate this, uh, this um, presentation I'm making to you to my mom. Um, we all hold our mothers dear to us, so I lost my mom in March. She went on to that spirit place. And that's my Dene side, my Navajo. And it's very important in many of our cultures as native indigenous people is our relationship to our mothers. Because we, we swam inside that big ocean within her all those months. Then our mothers passed the water. Then we come out into this world and we gasp for that breath, that breath, that spirit that comes into us from this outside world. So I always talk about these things and that's why I wanted to think, I was thinking about my mom. Those of you that follow me on my Facebook, I do have one of those entities called Facebook. <laughs> And uh, I made a comment in there that I miss my mom. I, I look forward to her sometimes calling me. She checks in with me because she knows that I travel all over the world and she worries about me. So she used to always call me, especially when I don't make a call within that week, let alone two weeks, and she calls me. So every now and then, I longed for her to call me. So I missed her the other day. So we all have evidence of that relationship, not only to that reflection of that sacredness, that creative principle that we call unchimaka, 
in Dakota, Grandmother Earth, Unchimaka. We all have that evidence of our relationship to Unchimaka. My mother is a reflection of Unchimaka. And we all have that evidence uh, with this little belly button. We have an innie or an outer, eh? How many have innies? In How many have out outers? And those of you that don't have a belly button, I welcome you here, my relatives from some other place in the universe. But part of that invisible tie that we don't see anymore is that in biblical court, the umbilical cord that ties us into the earth. That's our connection. That's why there's those of us that come from our culture, we hold on to that, that piece of that cord. And we keep it for our child. Because that's we keep that and we honor that evidence. We, all, we are all witnesses to that connection. So as our child is raised, we, we, we talk about that. We talk about that birthing process. We talk about that evidence here, that cord and how we sew it into our, a pouch because that defines the relationship. That relationship that goes with them for the rest of their life. Because they're taught how to walk upon Unchimaka, Mother Earth. But also they're, un they're able to understand their relationship to the sky. Father Sky and Mother Earth. That helps to understand that sacred creative principle, which is part of the natural laws that we talk about in our sacred language. The natural law, the natural law of Wakantanka, the great spirit, the great mystery. And I saw the poster up front, Peace on Earth, Peace with Earth. And the hashtag promoting enduring peace. And I was thinking about that. Because within my worldview, with my indigenous thinking, it would be extremely difficult for me to talk about peace and to live peace, to have peace of mind, to shorten that distance between my mind and my heart. Sometimes that's the longest road for people in this world. It could be hundreds of miles from here to here, thousands of miles between our mind and our heart. And how is that influenced by our relationship and how we walk on Mother Earth? And how do we achieve peace of mind and peace with ourselves and our families? How does that define our male relationship with our mothers? with our grandmothers, with our aunties, with our nieces, with our daughters, with our granddaughters, our sisters, if we don't understand what that relationship is. To have peace between the man and the woman. Not competition, not war, what is the values and the ethics that we develop in society 
if we don't have that relationship with the sacredness and the creative principles of Unchimaka, of Mother Earth, of Grandmother Earth, peace, an enduring peace. So all that I was thinking about when I saw the bumper sticker. <laughs> it was like a little bright light that jumped out. That's why I've been carrying it, and put it on this little bench. So thank you, thank you for the chief to uh, introduce me. I feel very honored. Uh, I feel very honored. And that's a teaching that goes way back in oral history. To be introduced by a chief in their territories. Think about that a long time ago. Somebody travels to another people's territory. What is the protocol coming into that territory? Do I just kind of walk right in? Just walk on right in with my other brothers? Maybe we have our sisters with us and our grannies. Sometimes, though, they're not with us. Do I just waltz right in? No, there's protocols. I have a friend, and he's, he's older than I am. That's been the course of my life. I have these older men friends. They should be my grandpas. But I don't know. It's not like that. We're like brothers. Orin Lyons, who knows Orin Lyons? Faith keeper up here, the Onondagas. We're like brothers. So we were talking about this, and he was telling me about their ways, and it was similar to our ways, as I was taught on the Dakota side. You don't just come walking right in. If you're alone, somehow, whatever got you there to be alone, you're coming to a village. You stand there like I am right now. Because they got scouts. They know you're there. So you just stand there. You wouldn't have your hands in your pocket. You have where they can see your hands. And you just stand there. Stand until they acknowledge you. You may be standing there two days, or longer or shorter. They'll come and get you when it's time. They'll bring you in. And so they have ones who are trained to look at you. Who is this person? They know how to look at you whether or not they're going to take you into that lodge where the leader is, or the leaders, or the council. They bring you in there. When you introduce yourself. Dakota Chaje Matho Awaya Kapi Mie. Dakota Chaje Matho Awaya Kapi Mie. That's who I am. It's my name. It's a name that was given to me by the Spirit. The plants recognize that name. The rocks recognize that name. The waters recognize, the air, the birds. They recognize that name, your Indian name. So I introduce myself to them. Protocols of peace, of who you are. Some of you come from that old world, they say, in Europe. Your Olaf's daughter, or Olaf's son. And you go back about this clan and that clan. You identify yourself so that they know who you are. They say, yes, I know who you are. We knew your grandpa. He was a hardworking man. We knew your grandmother. We're sorry she passed on. Relationships. We're developing relationships. 
So that's the way we approached it 25 years ago when we were called upon by elders and youth to come together, to come together to address this issue of environmental injustice, of mineral mining extractive industry operating in our territories. And our instructions, our mandates, is that they want this to stop. And how do we do that? What are the tools and the strategies to do that? So it just wasn't one fire, all of a sudden there was a bunch of fires to put out. Just here in the United States, not including Canada, not including Alaska. Our friend Sarah James with the Kuchin Steering Committee stopping the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from being opened up to oil drilling. They're part of our network. How do we help them? How do we help them develop the capacity to speak for themselves? So it was a hard journey for us. But part of it was to address the issue of equity. Equity to be able to have the resources to build the power that is already there in our communities to make the decisions themselves and to speak for themselves. And to address the racism even within the environmental movement. Oh, Native people, yeah. And not being able to figure out what is our role in protecting our territories and lands. And I made this point at one of the large uh, environmental organizations I was at. Almost every environmental organization was in this room. And I said, you know, I got a call yesterday from the executive director of the Kuchin Steering Committee. And they have no more funds. They're laying off their staff. They have no more funds. Yet the environmental organizations were raising millions of dollars on the campaign to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Why, when there's millions of dollars being raised in Washington, D.C., that the frontline communities don't have the resources to address this issue themselves? In solidarity, in alliance, with principles of movement building, of friendship, of relationship. Why is it that we had to battle with the coalition of the tar sand groups so that we can have staff and organizers on the front lines working with the community, empowering ourselves Breaking that long history of colonialism, that long history of militarization that the chief had mentioned, that long history of imperialism. We had our own warfares here. That, his, that long history of historical trauma. The evidence just came out Reportedly, they all knew it existed, but the final report from Canada on historical trauma that also goes into the core of how a system takes the spirit away from a population of peoples. Sexual abuse. Sexual abuse. That's one of the tactics of militarization, hey? Eh? Why is it in Canada, the generation a little bit older than me and my generation up there are having historical trauma as men and women of rape? There's that mentality of warfare, the perpetrators. Who taught them? That's what our elders used to say when they first met the people, the settlers, who taught them? Who are they? 
They didn't just stand there waiting to be invited into the village. They came, marched right in. They had different forms of weapons that shot these little, little round balls. They had their own weapons of mass destruction, the Gatling gun. So we, we put this together when we were called upon to form not just any kind of organization, but some organization that is a voice of people who cannot be here. I'm the eyes and ears of people who cannot be here. And you have to humble yourself. You've got to walk with humility. That's why I, my first question when I got notified, it was kind of like, well, who am I? Am I worthy for this recognition? That goes to my grandpa and his teaching, Pitacha Yuhamani, Pikachus, senior, a holy man. He passed away in 93. The family down here, his family took him in and they adopted him. He was their spiritual advisor, Martin Luther King's family. People don't know that. They trusted a Lakota holy man who talked about peace. compassion. So it's these virtues and values that are very important. That relationship with Mother Earth, Unchimaka. And like the introduction talked about, in our critical analysis and the work that we're doing within the Indigenous Environmental Network, we continue to be there as advocates for communities on the front lines. We're continuing to be there in an organizing uh, role to help organize and share tools and strategies and tactics on how to stop an exploit uh, exploitive, destructive industrial complex like the tar sands. Even that tar sands has a spirit of its own. It's already pretty strong. It's pushing these pipelines all over our turtle island here. That's why they had ceremonies in South Dakota. In the ceremonies, they said, this is the black dark snake. It's darkness. It has a spirit of its own. And it will confuse people to believe and support. That's why they debate over that pipeline. That we have to be true in our convictions. If we're going to continue to understand and learn that loving, compassionate, that peaceful role of Unchi Maka and what she does for us, that will provide and develop the environmental ethics that this world is lacking. So I was in the Amazon a year and a half ago. I went into the remote part of the Amazon, coming from Quito, going over the mountain, going into the green area, went down the river, four and a half hours, five hours on the river, going to a Seriaco village. I have some friends at Seriaco. And um, in one of those nights, uh, I had a dream. It wasn't just a dream, it was close to a vision. But this spirit, this woman of the forest, their mother earth, the mother of the forest came and she wanted to take me into the forest. But uh, I have a friend, it's a grizzly bear. <laughs> and the grizzly bear intervened on my behalf in that spirit realm and says, no, you cannot take him because he's needed. 
is needed in the north. And I talked to the shaman there that next day and his wife, she's a healer, she works the medicines. Their daughter is Patricia that goes with the Amazon watch and speaks out. Their niece is Nina, the youth that was on the Yes magazine. So Patricia's father and mother interpreted. And what this woman said for Paris is go talk to the woman. You're going to bring some women from the north who live along the river like they do. You're going to bring some women who are affected from the black liquid, the oil, and bring them together to form a treaty compact, a treaty agreement as defenders of Mother Earth, and to bring that document to Paris. So we're going to do that. We don't know how it's happening, but it's coming together. It's expensive in Paris. So we got to feed them. Food in Paris is expensive. <laughs> the metro, but some of these are elders, we got to put them in taxis. But in the document, they talked about what I'm talking about the relationship with the sacredness and the female creative principle of Mother Earth. Because they said, the woman said, yes, there's a disconnect. If we're going to have peace in this world, humanity has to understand that concept, that principle. Because humanity will continue to strive to have dominion, dominion over Mother Earth. The same way that the doctrines of discovery that were used in the conquest of the Americas, they needed the blessings of the church. Blessings of the church to say the indigenous people did not have a soul. To have the church to say we weren't civilized, we did not have a way of worship. We were pagans. So under the international laws of those times, that allowed the occupation of the Americas, legally. So how is it in the mentality that certain people across the ocean already knew that concept? Maybe they removed their own people that had that deep, profound spiritual relationship to Mother Earth in that old world. Because people were spiritually connected to the land. How do you tax them if they have a strong relationship to the land? They knew what food sovereignty was, eh? They knew how to give back in a reciprocal relationship to Mother Earth. So that's why the woman's statement addresses the core as a real solution is to break that concept. Because one of the, the main mitigation solutions coming out of Paris in these 21 years of climate negotiations at the highest level with their scientists and economists isn't to shut the valve down. They're going to burn every drop of fossil fuel, burn every fossil fuel that they can. And they'll stall, they'll stall with these false solutions. So now we're hearing in Europe of biodiversity offsets. We're hearing of conservation offsets. We're hearing about privatization of nature under the concepts of dominion. That Mother Earth doesn't have a soul. Mother Earth is a slave. Nature is capital. That if we put a value to Mother Earth, maybe the economics then will be able to factor in and save the environment if we can put a value. But that's, that's not the purpose. 
So how do we empower and mobilize civil society of the world? That's what we've been developing as a strategy with the climate coalition of the European groups and the French coalition and, and organizations and people of the world. The moral authority behind that isn't just indigenous peoples. It's the people who are the peasants and the farmers, the small farmers of the world as well. It's the women who can also break away from all the bondage, understand their relationship as the keepers of the water, like my auntie Josephine Madaman, who has walked around every one of the Great Lakes carrying a copper kettle of water, talking to all cultures about that relationship to water as life. She doesn't fill that copper petal up, kettle up and it actually evaporates, goes back into the cycle of life itself. So that's part of what we're going to be doing in Paris. Sure, Tom Goldtooth can go into the halls of the United Nations Conference of the Parties 21, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and we can debate the various documents. Now it's down to 60 pages, now it was down to 40, it's back up to 50, whoever's been keeping track. There's no really strong language coming out of Paris about mitigation, emission target reductions of uh, greenhouse gases, no. But it mentions carbon markets, carbon offsets, these other mechanisms throughout the document. It's coming there with China. China now is embracing cap and trade and carbon markets. It's a worldwide carbon Ponzi scam. <laughs> so that's our message going to be, and working with the envirals and the climate activists, we have something in, in agreement. We, we don't want to repeat what happened in Copenhagen at that United Nations meeting in Copenhagen in 2009 is that yes, there was an outcry from civil society and yes, there was a breakdown in the governments when this administration went in there. Why is it that Bolivia in that time tried to make interventions and, and other G77 developing countries tried to make interventions, in other words, to speak up, and the chair was denying them. And the woman from Venezuela, the lead negotiator, her hand was cut and bleeding, holding that aluminum name plaque of Bolivia, trying to get the attention of the chair at 1.30 in the morning when the meeting was going overtime and the chair was denying the intervention of Venezuela who was laying on the table the questions about mitigation not being the real solutions to climate change. Why is it Bolivia had their own global climate meeting in Cochabamba in April 2010? And at that time came up with the parallel document, the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. We've been, the United States has been fighting us they presented a resolution in Geneva on the rights of nature. They laughed. How can you have rights of nature? But it questions the whole legal paradigm of property rights. Why is it corporations have more rights than you do, that we do? The Tar Sands, the First Nations, who are the original peoples of that territory have to pay a lot of money to, to litigate in order to prove and get the right that they have legal standing in the colonial courts of Parliament of Canada. We have to do that here in the United States all the time. The corporations know that. They got legal standing. So how do we flip that as humanity so that Earth has jurisprudence? There's a right to have a healthy watershed and a water system. There's a right for a clean, healthy ecosystem. The tree does have standing. Who speaks for them? 
Are you the guardians in your structure that you develop in your local jurisdiction? Are you the guardians for nature, to make sure nature's rights are heard? As humanity, we are going into that direction. That is the prophecies. That's why we're recognizing our prophecies. So the, the strategy in Paris is that we, you, the people of the world have the last word. We know the Paris Accord, the Paris Agreement is not going to be what we need to save Mother Earth as we know her. Our people say back home, Mother Earth is going to be okay. But she's going to put herself to rights. There's going to be more hurricanes, more tornadoes, more natural healing processes that she has to go through. We are the vulnerable species. We got to wear clothing. We are the vulnerable ones. So we're going to have the last word. We know that document isn't going to be what we need to bring us in the world down to 2,000 degrees Celsius, I mean 2.0 Celsius, or even 1.5. I've been to Africa. Two, two, two degrees is devastating to Africa. Africa right now is wide open to what I've been talking about, the market system. Climate smart agriculture is going to be a land grab of land in Africa. The investors are the mining corporations, the pension funds, petroleum industry, agriculture, the corporations. They're going to be buying up that land. They're investing in that land for carbon sequestration. The trees that they're buying in the, in the tropical forest, whose trees? Those are not the local trees of the people. It's Chevron in Richmond, California, so that they can look good and greenwash. And the pendulum, they said, we went carbon neutral. How did they go carbon neutral when they continue to expand toxic admissions at the refineries in Richmond and, Mar and Martinez, California, where there's a sh shell operation. Our tar sands corporations participating in this. No, there's local, continued local cancer clusters, respiratory illnesses, etc. Not alone, not even talking about impacts to the ecology, life, other life itself, and who speaks for them. So peace, that's what I think about, is that relationship we have with Mother Earth is very important. Peace on Earth, peace with Earth. And how is that, what is that concept for you? To have peace with yourself, and peace with Mother Earth. To make offerings to Mother Earth to make offerings and songs, give songs back to Mother Earth. That's what she told us to do thousands of years ago. That's why many of the tribes in Europe, tribes in Africa, tribes in Southeast Asia, the Sami, they all had songs in relationship to the earth and nature, plants. So we gotta lift up our voices and and sing those songs. So I'm going to share a song with you. Uh, it's an old song, they say. Someone said, thousand years old. I don't know. I don't ask those questions. You know, when I was growing up, I always asked questions. And they said, shh, don't ask questions. Just listen. Now here I am. I'm an elder now, you know. I got kids and grandkids, they, they ask me questions, you know. But this time I, I kind of don't say, shh, be quiet, just listen. You know, I actually try to break things down as best as I know it. But this song talks, of, this, this, ta this song is one of the, the ceremonial songs we have. And when you sing a song, when you do your ceremonies, you do your meditation, you make 
somehow whatever you do to establish your connection to a higher power, however you define that. You cast out your feelings, you cast out part of your heart, your mind, your spirit, you cast it out like a fisher person maybe, you're casting it out way over there. And you're kind of listening or you're expecting in return to be heard. Especially in this moment, you're giving yourself and we all want to be heard. Is she listening? Is he listening? That's what this song is all about that. Relationship and peace of mind. And you're singing out to that spiritual realm, giving yourself. Then you wait to see if you're going to get a song back to you. So if you stand up if you can to honor this song and many of the people who have uh, passed on since that song uh, was shared with people. Kashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakashtakasht